Hi everyone. The purpose of this video is to go over the quantitative research designs that you'll need to know for this class. So we're really going to focus on this top set of designs in this video. In the next video, you will look at the qualitative designs. Um, just it's too much information to cover two designs. So we're going to cover two experimental and quasi-experimental designs, then we'll look at the non-experimental designs as well. Now if you see in the true experimental and quasi-experimental designs the um, make this a little bit bigger here um, they're really two different type and experimental is what you think of as your you know traditional research. This is where you are applying two or major components in order to be experimental research. You are applying what's called control and you are applying some form of manipulation. That means you are either giving an intervention, so you are giving a supplement, or you are giving, you are introducing one group to a certain type of strength training and another group to traditional strength training. So you have a control and you're manipulating. Now there are two different types of experimental designs. In a true experimental design, the researcher can truly manipulate or control all levels through random assignment. What that means is that I can fully def define if you are in a control group or in the experimental group. I can decide if you get a certain component or a certain um, a certain supplement or not. In comparison, in quasi-experimental, I can't control all levels. I might have an independent variable like gender, you're going to see this or listed down here. Gender differences, if I'm looking at the differences between male or female, I can't define if you are a male or a female. So as a result, I have to, it's not fully true experimental research, it's quasi-experimental. Um, same other examples would be I couldn't define if you are a varsity athlete or a JV athlete, a D1 athlete or a D2 athlete. I couldn't define if you were in first grade or eighth grade. Somebody else defines that for you. It's an attribute you bring to the table. Next lecture will define that as an attribute variable where in, um, these are called attribute variables, where in true experimental research we use what's called active variables, where I can fully control everything. I provide some examples here uh, for you to look through. I want you to think of examples for your own area of research as well, um, making sure you can tell the difference. Now, the biggest takeaway between that is that you also have to know... Sorry about that. Um, so, the major takeaway, besides understanding the control and manipulation for all experimental designs, is knowing that in true experimental design, because we can fully manipulate it, we can imply cause and effect. Because of the way that we manipulated the independent variable, we know that a certain effect on the dependent variable occurred. In comparison, in quasi-experimental, I can't imply cause and effect. I can, I can come pretty close to it, but it, I can, the only place where I can imply cause and effect in any research design is a true experimental design. Now we're moving on to non-experimental designs. The, in none of the rest of the designs in any other design will we be able to imply cause and effect. This next set of designs, the classification is called survey research, and we're going to have a whole unit just on survey research. Um, but within survey research, there's three types. So survey research, the major goal is to provide information about current uh, excuse me, uh, current practices, conditions, or demographic data. For example, I could do a questionnaire research where what I'm trying to find out is what are the current practices of Division three schools regarding um, response to concussions. And I might send out questionnaires to a whole bunch of Division three schools, athletic training rooms, and athletic departments and ask them how they deal with concussions. So this can be carried out by mail, I could mail out the questionnaires, I could interview somebody in person, or I could do it over the telephone, or I could hand out the questionnaire in person, or I could do it 
or do the questionnaire over telephone. It's a very common research method. Most of you will do it at some or some form of re, or survey research at some point in your careers. The problem is, is while it's very common and very easy to do, it's not usually done well unless you do a lot of very good preparation. To take one step off of that, you could then move up into interview survey research. Essentially, this is just taking a questionnaire and doing it more by actually doing it more qualitative. A lot of open-ended questions talking to a person um, where you can ask follow-up questions or clarify questions. So that becomes a little bit easier. The problem is it's extremely time-consuming um, and hard to get a lot of people. I could go to a... Um, for questionnaire research or survey research, I could go to a stadium and I could, at the stadium, I could um, give out 450 questionnaires in maybe 30 minutes. So I could have a really huge sample size in a very short period of time. However, in it might take me 30 minutes to interview just one or two people in interview research. So that can be really time consuming. That is a major, major problem with interview research. The final type here is a normative survey research. This is done when you have very large sample sizes. This is thousands of people. And basically what we're trying to get is how does the typical population perform on a given test or a given situation. So we might be trying to look at norms for here I have normative values for power lifts for Division One lacrosse players. How what is what is their norm for a um, hang clean? What is their norm? Uh, their norm for we could go to um, Olympic lifts and you know what's their norm for a back squat? Um, you could look at what are the normative GPAs for Division One athletes. Uh, those would be all normative studies. Now, correlational research is the next type of research we're going to look at. Correlational research is the key word here that we care about is relationships. We're looking to examine the relationship between certain variables. It is descriptive in nature because we're only looking at relationships. We are not, um, we are not in any way controlling. We are not manipulating. And without control or manipulating, we cannot imply cause and effect. You can only look at the degree or relationship. So for example here, I have a relationship where at the I'm looking at playing time as one of my variables, and my other variable is going to be satisfaction. And what I'm looking for is to understand the relationship between playing time and satisfaction. What we know is chances are, if you don't play very much, you're probably not going to be very satisfied in a new sport program. If you play a lot, you might be really, really happy. So we have this relation, or we have a relationship that develops that as your playing time increases, you tend to have higher satisfaction. What could also be a relationship is we could have something that looks the other direction, where we could have. Um, as playing time increases, you could have something decrease. So as playing time increases, maybe the number of mistakes you make or errors you make decreases. So that would be a negative relationship. Now very similar, or very comparable at least, to uh, correlational research is what's called ex post facto. Ex post facto is Latin for essentially meaning after the fact or done afterwards. Sometimes this is also what's called a causal comparative design. And the key word here being comparative. They're similar to experimental designs because we are going to try to look at differences between groups. However, there is absolutely no randomization, no control. If there's no randomization or control or manipulation, then it cannot be uh, experimental. Also, if there's no manipulation or control, we still can't imply causality. But we are looking to compare two groups after the fact. 
So maybe what happens is I go in and I decide to go to, uh, let's say we'll go to UMass. And I'm at UMass and I decide to look at the GPAs, so from a 0 to a 4.0, between athletes. Maybe they have something like a 2.3 and non-athletes, and maybe they have something like a 3.3. .3. So this is going to be athletes and non-athletes. And I'm just looking to compare between those two groups. The other example I he give here is looking at the comparison between parents from or athletic participation from a one-parent home versus a two-parent home and you might have kids who have one parent can't participate as much compared to those who have two parents. So these are trying to compare between groups. Make sure not to mix that up with correlation, where correlation is looking at the relationship between two variables. Now, these last are or last two sets that I'm going to show you are special um, types of designs. They aren't or they're more building blocks on what the types of designs we've already presented. Developmental research means that there's, we're looking for some change over time. Now there's two different ways that we can examine change over time from a research perspective. The first type that we can look at is from a longitudinal perspective. This is where I'm going to track people over a number of months or years to see how they change. So maybe I want to look at athletes, or I want to look at athletes from youth sport all the way to professional sport. So this might be a 30-year period of research, and I want to see if you specialized versus if you diversified. So if you were a specialized athlete, you only did swimming from day one versus if you tried swimming and basketball and soccer and what have you, to see how it de affected certain dependent variables like burnout, success, and enjoyment over that 30-year period. That can be extremely time-consuming because that means as a researcher you need to employ, you know, to invest 30 years to your research project. So some people, in order to make up for the amount of time commitment, instead do what's called a cross-sectional design. Here is where we do the same thing, but instead of looking at across 30 years, taking 30 years to do the project, I'm going to, if this is 0 and this is age 30, I am going to, or really 34 apparently, um, look at people, I'm going to get a group of people who are 6 year olds, I'm going to get a group of people who are 10 year olds, 14 year olds, and so you can see how I'm making cross sections in the timeline, 18 and so on, until I get to 34 and I'm covering from youth sport to your professional career. And I get information about the same stuff, burnout, success, and enjoyment. Now, I can do this in one shot. In one semester, maybe I can get a group of 26-year-olds, 2010-year-olds, 2014-year-olds, and so on. The problem is, is there might be something about six-year-olds today that would be different than if I followed the same six-year-olds for 30 years, as comparative if I wanted to um, it, it's what's called a cohort effect, where there's something about how time or this cross section of time differs from this cross section of time due to, you know, what might be the requirements in physical education or in sports these days that could change in the next ten years or are different than ten years ago. So cross sectional is much faster from a time perspective, but we are concerned about this cohort effect. The last design that I'm going to introduce is one of the most powerful, and I would say that it is getting, uh, gaining a lot of popularity in what should be done in research. Um, it's called a meta-analysis. The problem is it's very hard to do. A meta-analysis is used to summarize and evaluate other studies to look at why they're different, similar or different. It do, it's not simply a review of those studies, but what the researcher does is actually take the initial data from all of the other studies and puts them in one big data set and reanalyzes the question using the data set. Um, the problem is, or one of the limitations is that a substantial amount of research has to have been done in a given area for you to do a meta-analysis. And there's just not that many areas of research in 
our fields that are that popular. In sports psychology, one of them is related to motivational climate. Motivation is a huge topic. It's been researched very extensively. Um, in strength and conditioning, one of the ones that would be extremely popular, and you could probably do something, would be something related to vertical jump. Again, it's a long study variable, long, or, or vertical jump in power. Um, so you really need something that's been done so many times that you could take 10 different studies and put them together. Uh, the example here I have of reanalyzing all the studies that examine how anxiety and if, uh, anxiety affects performance between males and females. So this is a really, really um, important type of research, and if you happen to find a meta-analysis study for... Um, for any review of lit, for your thesis or independent study or dissertation, it is what it, it is hugely helpful because it's going to give you information about probably 10, 15, 20 other studies. So this is a really cool design when you find it. Now I want you to click over and watch the qualitative, uh, qualitative video and be prepared when you come in class to make examples for each of these types of designs from your own area of study with your group.